Will you join me in a word of prayer? Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Who are your enemies? If I gave you a piece of paper and asked you to write them down, could you? Would the answers come easily? Or would you have to drudge up old hurts that you try not to return to? I remember this girl I considered my enemy in college. We didn't like each other. I have no idea why. And one night, the campus police called me and said someone had reported my parking sticker was a fake that allowed me to park in student housing, which was weird enough. But then I showed up. I showed him my student ID. It was all cleared up, and the officer said to me, now, is there, do you have an enemy that would have made this report? And I thought, I couldn't think of anyone, and I tried really hard. I squinted my eyes to think of who my enemy could be, and this girl was the only person I could think of, even though I doubted she would pull this kind of lame prank. But then this week, when I was thinking about what Jesus is saying about loving our enemies, And I asked, who are my enemies? Again, her face was the first one to pop into my mind. I had to text a friend to remember her name. I thought it was Liza or Vera. It turns out it was Lyra, so I was right. But I have no idea what her last name was. Do you even know the last name of your enemy? Or maybe your enemy is more like a frenemy, someone that is your friend but also your enemy, someone you have to interact with all the time but you just can't stand. Or, or maybe your enemy is someone who has hurt you deeply or hurt deeply someone you loved. And that feeling is real and not to be dismissed or made light of. So maybe that is always true if we will go so far as to name someone as an enemy. Maybe your enemies are people that we all know. No, I'm not talking about the person in church. Jeez, guys. I'm talking about politicians or celebrities, those who have said or done things that have hurt maybe not you personally, but our earth or our culture impacted the lives of countless people for their own agenda. Or maybe when you think of enemies or you hear the word enemy, you think of times of war when there is a very clear enemy, a shared enemy, the ones or one we are fighting against. Maybe your list is pretty clear, but as I heard Jesus' words anew, love your enemy. And everything that followed in this text that Anne read for us, which is basically using different words of saying, love your enemy, I couldn't quite name very many enemies. Lyra might, maybe, but I haven't seen her in 20 years, so I should probably get over that. And if I thought really hard, I could name some of those politicians and celebrities that make my blood boil. But honestly, there weren't too many. It seemed I could find my way out of naming very many folks as my enemy. Even with foreign nations, I'm not really comfortable naming any country as an enemy. Maybe Russia is supposed to be our enemies right now, but my neighbors moved in across the street and they're from Russia and they are definitely not my enemies. It feels strange, if not wrong, to make a sweeping statement like that for an entire country of people who may or may not agree with the actions of their government. So maybe my enemy list isn't too long, and whew, that makes this text so much easier. I must be so mature to be able to handle what Jesus has asked of us. And you know, as I studied this week, strangely, multiple commentaries I read talked about youth when explaining this text. One writer, Jonah Smith Bartlett, wrote, Youth in particular might find significant difficulties with the text in light of the bullies and cliques and the ever-changing relationships of adolescence. He continues, It's no secret that young people want to know what they need to do in order to pass the trial of completing a writing assignment or making the cuts for the basketball team. When the youth of our church ask what it is they need to do in order to be Christian, responding to Luke, responding with Luke 6, 27 through 36 will likely earn this response. That's impossible. Reading that reminded me of a youth group I led about this text when I was the youth minister in Kentucky 
a few years after 9-11, just a few years after 9-11, and just a few miles up the road from Fort Campbell Military Base. Many of the kids had friends and family who were active in the military, and the non-violent leanings of this text didn't sit well with them. Actually, I was assuming because of the military connection that that is why the kids reacted the way they did, but maybe it is instead what Smith Barth Bartlett wrote. Kids have enemies. They offer that identity, sometimes to the bullies, and sometimes to their cranky friends or their ex-best friend, and sometimes even to their siblings. When we discussed this in that youth group, I asked the kids what they thought, and they got so rowdy. Jesus didn't really mean it, they told me. It's just a good thing to say. Oh, okay. That doesn't make sense, another said. The world doesn't work that way. So I was informed by a group of 11 to 17-year-olds. Interestingly, I have never had that much pushback on this text from a group of adults. And I think I have figured out why. We found a loophole. That's right. It's not that I'm mature, but in adulthood, most of us have figured out that if we don't label anyone as our enemy, voila, we don't have to love them. I mean, I know there is a whole love your neighbor thing, but we have workarounds for that one as well. In some ways, we have convinced ourselves that it is good that we don't label anyone, country, or people from it as our enemy. We know there is dissent, right, in other countries. Oh, do we know there is dissent within countries. We also know that there are often reasons that pe people make bad decisions. Maybe they suffer trauma as a child or they suffer mental illness or even if there is no reason, we try to hashtag find the good and name them as God's child, which of course means they couldn't be our enemy. And that all sounds just right, like what we're supposed to be doing here. See, no enemies, well then we are off the hook. Except for when we don't, we can say all of these things and have these ideas of, oh, they're not my enemy because I can understand where they're coming from. Even though I don't want to do anything on their behalf, I don't want to advocate for them, I don't want to speak up for them. But there is that tricky thing about love, isn't it? As we heard in that text, do good. Not just think a somewhat nice thought once in a while, but love calls us to action. And so the thing is, folks, sorry, there are no loopholes here. I know it's exactly not what you expect your pastor to say, but maybe we need to cast the net wider in naming our enemies. And if you quote me just on that, you better make sure people read the whole sermon. It's odd even to say, but stay with me. If we're honest about who our enemies are, as honest as our children are and youth are, we learn from them who name when they do not feel comfortable, happy, or safe with another person by naming them their enemy. If we're honest about that, we would remember just how radical this text is. We would have to face the truth that when Jesus says, love your neighbor and love your enemy, he doesn't just mean foreign countries, but also means your obnoxious brother-in-law. Love your enemy might make you think of the bully from high school, but it includes your ex-spouse and your coworker who lets their food rot in the fridge and the person whose social media posts make your skin crawl. You might not name these people as your enemies. But let's be real, if only for a moment, they probably are, which means, ah, you have to love them too. Now, in one way, I want to envision the world this scripture could lead to. If everyone who identified as a Christian actually loved their enemies, the kingdom would be on earth as it is in heaven. We take just a minute and imagine that with me? Close your eyes if you need to, which you might need to, to see Christians loving their enemy to every corner of the earth and what that would change in you and what that would change in your relationships 
and what that would change in our community and what that would change as our churches related to each other and what that would change in our world. Can you picture it? But I know in another way, I know this whole passage, if we do indeed take it seriously, we have to concede that the teenagers might be right. It is impossible. To make it worse, Matthew's rendition of this sermon from Jesus says that we are to be perfect as God is perfect. Might as well give up right now. Yet Luke doesn't aim for this same kind of perfection. And as a side note, honestly, the four Gospels are all speaking the same truth in different ways. So some, like Matthew, whose sermon comes from the mountain with this Jesus Sermon on the Mount, set higher goals so we know where we are headed, while Luke's sermon on the plain, that we, as we introduced last week, is more about relationship. Both are valid and both are needed and inspiring in different ways and for different people or for all people at different times. But as we are in Luke this week, the goal is not to be perfect as God is perfect, but a reconciliation with mercy. For in Luke we read, be merciful, not perfect, merciful, just as your God is merciful. This isn't about win or lose, but about striving towards something that feels impossible because even when we fail, we are still on the right path. You might have heard this quote before from writer and lay theologian G.K. Chesterton who said, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. Which is a much more articulate way of saying we are always looking for the loopholes. We are looking for ways to love Jesus and do enough of what he says that we don't have to take seriously this call to love the people we don't like. And frankly, maybe it is my own loophole, but I don't think we have to like everyone. That's an emotion. Love. Again, love is an action. Do good. We don't have to want to spend time with every human who rubs us the wrong way, but we have to work for their peace, to give to those in need with no expectation of reciprocity, to be who we are called to be regardless of who they are or how they choose to live and be. Now, while that is true, I do also need to say, which of course includes loving ourselves and not submitting to abuse, which perpetuates the sin of the abuser or oppressor. That is another sermon, but always needs to be named that this is not a text of submission. Love is strong and bold and always pursues wholeness through justice for all people, including ourselves. And I invite you and I ask you to remember that as you read and work to enact this text. So last Sunday morning during our adult dig group as we're digging deeper into scripture which meets at 9 a.m. in the Welcome Center if anyone's curious, Donna shared with us about a New York Times article about people leaving church and she was telling us that the main reason according to this article people are leaving was summed up in a quote that the one leader offered that said, we now see young evangelicals walking away from evangelicalism not because they do not believe what the church teaches, but because they believe that the church itself does not believe what the church teaches. Let me read that again. People are leaving the church not because they do not believe what the church teaches, but because they believe that the church itself does not believe what the church teaches. This article was particularly about evangelicals, and so we could be tempted to say, well, this isn't true of us, or to say something like, well, maybe they're getting what they deserved. Oh, but then Jesus says, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Be merciful as God is merciful. So then we listen to what this leader has to say, and we love and we even hear this critique directed at us as well. Do we believe what the church teaches? Do we believe it enough to confess our true enemies so that we know that we are called to love them in action? As the first song we gathered for worship this morning said, to be God's love. For the way of Jesus is not 
easy. This call to love is not about chocolates or roses or delight, but is about risk and patience and mercy and mercy and mercy and mercy. So maybe we should try again. Who are your enemies? Picture them. All of them. And picture what it would look like to love them. To bless them. To pray for them. To show them mercy. And know that is the kingdom of God. Amen.